Hi everyone, I'm Wes Kell. Welcome to the program. Today we start the discussion around leadership. Now leadership, like accountability and ownership, is one of those concepts that everyone will readily agree is important, but when you ask them to describe what it is, they really can't tell you. They draw a blank. They might be able to tell you why it's important and even provide you some examples of leadership, but describing what it really is, that's a whole different story. And the reason why is because leadership is an abstraction. It's an abstract concept. Leadership can take on many different expressions. Depending upon the people and circumstances involved, leadership can have a very large number of manifestations. And it's hard to see how all those different expressions of leadership all fit together. You know, what is the common theme that joins them together? That's the problem with abstractions. It's hard to see the underlying theme, and trying to find it can make your head hurt. Well, today we're going to save you some trouble, and we're going to set forth Kale Partners' understanding of what is leadership, hence the title of today's video cast, Grasping Leadership. Now, our focus here is going to be on describing what is leadership. We're not going to teach you in today's instruction how to be a leader. We're not going to provide you a bunch of laws and principles and rules of the road for being a good leader. All of that will come in future video casts. Today what we want to do is make sure you understand what leadership is. And the reason why is that many of you are or will be in leadership positions in your organizations. And if you're not in a leadership position, on a transactional basis, on a given project or a given event, a given interaction, you're going to have to assume a leadership role. And I want you to have an understanding of what it is that you're involved in. You know, what is the game that you're playing with here? Because leadership operates in an environment, a context of risk. Something is at stake. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for leadership. Well, when you get involved in these esoteric discussions about leadership, you can forget that very fact that it's all about managing risk. And you can get some strange ideas of what it means to be a leader. Well, what we're going to try and do here is strip all that stuff away and focus upon the practical elements of what is this thing called leadership so you can decide whether you want to be a leader or not going forward. And with that said, let's take a look at our agenda. Today's agenda has the following items. First, in leadership, plainly speaking, I will provide a straightforward description of Cal Partners' vision of leadership. We will then spend the rest of this video cast looking at leadership from different angles to provide you some richer color around what this description really means. In the next two items, management and leadership and attributes, I will contrast leadership with management so that you have a crisper understanding of how the two are related, but also how they are distinctly different. Next, in the good and the bad, we will look at how leadership is agnostic about whether it is used for good purposes or for bad ones. Finally, in learning leadership, We'll first talk about the importance of leadership to your personal development and success within the organization. Then I'll close with the discussion of the different ways of learning leadership and the method that Cal Partners will use in our instruction. And finally, we'll review. So let's take a look at leadership, plainly speaking. Here's how Cal Partners defines leadership, and I'll warn you, it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful. Leadership is the non-coercive influence of others to voluntarily confront risks or suffer hardship that takes place when the leader connects with a hope in the heart of the lead. Now, this is clearly a more specific definition than some of the one-liners or soundbite definitions you may have heard from other sources, but it does have the benefit of standing up to inspection. Let's walk through this a little bit more slowly. As you can see, there are three clauses here that comprise the exercise of leadership. First and foremost, Leadership is an influencing technique. This means that it is not a controlling technique. You don't exercise leadership when you have control over events. That would sort of be counterintuitive to the whole idea of leading, right? How could you lead things if you're in control? You lead things when you're not in control but are trying to establish it. This also means that leadership is nestled among other influencing techniques like incentives and threats. But as we have said, Leadership is non-coercive in nature. That sort of rules out blackmail and intimidation as leadership techniques. Not that they're not effective, they're just not leadership. So leadership is influence that requires the consent of those who are being led. Secondly, leadership entails getting others to voluntarily choose to either overcome things that scare them or to relinquish things that they find comfortable. 
So leadership only matters when what is being asked of the lead is contrary to their apparent basic interests. Leadership is what influences them to put aside their apparent or basic interests for other interests that they may have. But the fulcrum here is in the third point. The fulcrum upon which leadership levers influence over others is the fact that leaders exercise their influence as a result of the fact that they have made a connection, some connection at some level with those who are listening or observing them. They have made a connection with the lead. And whether by words or by deeds, the leader has connected with an interest of the lead that surmounts their concerns for those lesser interests we just mentioned. As such, leadership implies three important things. First, leadership entails that those who are led, also known as the followers, conveying power to the leader by their assent to his or her direction and judgment. And this power is not dependent on established authority levels within the organization. So while leadership can exist within the established hierarchy of your organization, it doesn't have to. It is independent of it. And this can be rather unnerving for people in positions of authority within the organization who happen to be weak leaders, particularly when there are strong leaders within the organization. And most importantly, leadership is not just about getting something done. It is about the identity of the followers and the leader. People who choose to be led believe that their association with the leader and his or her cause means that at some level they are being someone that they felt they were not before. In other words, they are tapping into a part of their identity that they may not have expressed previously. Now, although this statement of leadership is not a simple one-liner, it is merely the crest of all the other supporting material that gives rise to this concept of leadership. While comprehending this high-level statement is necessary, it really isn't sufficient for you to appreciate the significance of leadership without some more background in the source material. And there are basically three classes of source material. The first source is philosophy. Now, given that I said that leadership is an abstract concept, this is actually a pretty good place to start in obtaining a supporting primer in leadership. The only problem with going to the philosophical literature is that it's not really cohesive. You have to read several different writers in order to survey the concepts that impinge upon leadership, and then you have to reconcile them to come up with your own sense of leadership. While this will be a lengthy and very confusing exercise for you to go through, that is precisely why it will be beneficial for you. So it's something to consider. The second source is the academic literature. And there are two types of information here, which I call clinical and commercial. The clinical information is the pure academic research material that tries to articulate what is taking place in various leadership scenarios, while the commercial type of information is pretty straightforward as well. This is the province of folks who have been able to put a number on something, the 12 laws, the 8 principles, the 20 revelations of God, whatever. Both types of academic sources of information have significant pluses. The only problem is that for the most part, they are written without an understanding of the poetry of leadership. The pure academic clinical folks suffer particularly in this regard. Their writing about leadership is sort of like asking a robot to describe a Renoir painting. They'll tell you things like, it's a picture. It's made with oil paint. It looks like a woman with a hat. And there's some blue and some yellow. And it appears a little blurry. While all of those things are true, in fact, some of them may even be helpful, it really just doesn't capture what is going on. And that's one of the problems with the clinical academic literature. While it accurately describes what's taking place, it really doesn't capture what's really going on. Now, the commercial folks, they're onto this, and they try to bring out some of the more lyrical elements of leadership. Unfortunately, many of these writers stumble upon a couple of things. The first is that they or their instructors have no real practical experience themselves in leadership situations. This is particularly true when dealing with the element of personal risk. One of the things that can also take place is that because they're worried about missing out on the larger market of folks who are concerned with management issues as opposed to leadership issues, these folks tend to blend management and leadership together and come up with some mishmash that sounds a lot like you can be it all if you just take this pill. You can be a great leader and you can be a great manager and there's no distinction between the two that is meaningful. All you got to do is buy my book. And unfortunately, that's just not true. Now, all that said, 
As a truth in advertising statement, I too am one of those commercial folks, with the possible exception that I believe I know a thing or two about risk, and I'm not going to blur the lines between leadership and management in order to make anyone feel better about themselves. Now, because I believe there's a great deal of material in these two sources, philosophy and academic literature, that will be helpful to you in your understanding of leadership, I've developed a reading list of philosophical and academic materials that I think will be helpful to you in your personal study, and you will find it in the template section of this videocast. Now, my preferred source of background on leadership material is the practical, what I call the school of hard knocks. This consists of your observations and your experiences as you watch real people, Folks who don't have a clue about Aristotle or Covey's Third Principle or the Vroom Yetten model or anything else like that, but who are struggling every day to figure out what the right thing is to do, to find the will and courage to pursue it, and then to move forward against opposition to see what happens. This is the world where management and leadership are very different animals. Both disciplines are very good, they both have their limits, and they both can be learned, but they are very different. And it is in this world of the practical that is my focus. So let's look more closely at this practical side of things by taking a closer look at the relationship between management and leadership. At a high level, when we think about management, it deals with expectations. It is the use of analysis, reporting, policy, processes, roles, and delegated authority to channel group efforts to meet expectations. Management values influencing techniques like leadership, but it is not dependent upon them. Management is equipped with a set of tools that enables it to meet most expectations on a predictable basis without ever needing leadership. Now, the focus of management activity differs based upon the level of expectations that the management activity is being directed at. If expectations are low, the management is focused upon achieving stated or implied goals that have been set by their manager. And managers seek to achieve their goals with an eye on all the competing forces that are acting on them. Their own interests, their boss's interests, their peers' interests, their staff's interests, the constraints of their budget, time, you name it. They're trying to reconcile all of those forces and live within the constraints that they have to deal with. And it is management at this level of low expectations that is what is commonly understood as management. But even at this level, it is clear that managers are positioned to deal with a constantly changing chessboard that appears to be rigged against their success. And when you think about the effort that they have to go through in order to achieve success with all of these constraints and all of these variables, clearly management is a non-trivial, even noble pursuit. However, if senior management's expectations of more junior management are that they do more than take care of near-term issues, the managers have an even more elevated set of concerns that they have to worry about. Managers at this level have to ensure that the organization's competencies are aligned with the organization's purpose. This requires the manager to think strategically and consider where the environment is going, what competencies will be required to succeed irrespective of whether there are specific goals that need to be attained with inside the current year, and the managers have to fund, structure, recruit, train, market, and execute in such a way that the organization is sustainable in the long term. In short, when you bundle these two together, the low and the high sets of expectations, management is the stuff which makes organizations run. Well, that all sounds well and good, but what is leadership in this context? Well, leadership is a complement to management, and it is a tool that can be used to achieve some goals that management cannot. And there are two points bundled up with inside this. First, there are simply some problems for which management is not enough. Management is a good preventative strategy for dealing with most problems, and it is also vitally important for correcting problems once they arise. But management's central characteristic of balancing competing forces, the emphasis of harmony over achievement, is sometimes at odds with what is needed to address certain problems, particularly those that are the most dangerous to the organization. Secondly, leadership is not a substitute for effective management. The reverse is true as well. You can be a great leader and still be a terrible manager. You can also be a great manager and a terrible leader and anywhere in between those two extremes. To illustrate the condition and the profile, how the two are different, how they behave differently, 